well, let's get things underway with Enrique Chang, who is the Global Chief Investment Officer at Janus Henderson. He's hosting our first panel, looking at investment themes in the year ahead. And as Suzanne just said, we'd really like to hear from you as well. So don't forget, we've got that Q&A box that you can send us your questions and we'll attempt to answer them, get them to our panelists. At the end of the session, I'll be moderating your questions then. So over to you, Enrique. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, it's Enrique Chang. Uh, nice to be here today. Uh, we have a panel that's gonna focus on two risk factors that have really uh, crept up uh, in the financial markets over the last uh, six months. Prior to the second half of last year, it seemed that markets could only go one way, up, up, up for both credit markets, fixed income markets in general, and clearly for 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 stocks. And the uh, the riskier and the higher the PE of the stock, the higher that uh, the likely returns are like we're going to be over the next period. That has all changed in the second half of last year for two reasons that are highly correlated. Uh, the first one being the rise of inflation. We have not had real inflation for many, many years, but the moment uh, we started to see it, markets got very spooked and has impacted markets uh, really across the board, wherever there's risk in any particular security or, or part of the industry of the market. Uh, associated with that is the ongoing geopolitical risk that we see in Eastern Europe with Russia and Ukraine. And, and that is really about two things, democracy and, and energy prices. And we'll get into at least one of those uh, later on today. So my first question is to Jim, our global head of fixed income, as it applies to those two topics. Um, what are we likely to see in 2022 and beyond, right? As those as those two risk factors continue to materialize in the uh, in the markets as it applies to interest rates, both real and nominal, and what are the likely responses from central banks uh, in near term and intermediate term based on the fear of inflation? So, Jim, over to you on that question. Yeah, thanks, Enrique. I think it's fair to say that both markets and central banks are a bit panicked by inflation. The transitory story that they were glued to for so long, I think they've had to throw, throw out. And for good reason, inflation in the U.S. is likely to exceed 7% year on year when we get the numbers tomorrow. And a lot of what we're seeing is not as transitory as they would have really liked. So interest rates have spiked. Um, what does it mean going forward? I, I think you can make a good case that some of the bottlenecks are beginning to clear. Some of the spikes in pricing um, should abate, but inflation is going to remain above their 2% target um, across the globe, I think in all markets for at least all of 2022. But that said, I think inflation should roll over. The economic growth rate should roll over. And I think this is on a little bit of a collision course with the expectations for what central banks are going to do. And so when we, we talk about interest rates, I, I really struggle at this point in the cycle to talk about one interest rate. I think of the policy rate, whether you know, base rates, Fed funds rates, you know, things like that. There are short-term bond rates, say like a two or three-year note. And then there are 10 and 30-year notes and bonds. And I think the answer is quite different when you look at what is priced in. One of the advantages of bonds is you can see exactly what is expected in the forward curve. And four to five rate hikes, for example, out of the Fed is already priced in. So I think that is almost certain to happen. March is liftoff you know, for the Federal Reserve. You know, the Bank of England has already moved. I think the ECB can afford to wait you know, for quite some time. They're gonna taper first and withdraw liquidity first before they consider rate rises. But what does that mean for longer dated yields? I, I think is a key question for not just bond investors, but I think for all risk assets. And, and, and as we get 10 years approaching 2%, say in the US, I, I actually think a lot of the selling is exhausted. I don't think we need to go much higher than 2% if indeed some of these risk factors abate. We've had a big move. Um, most of that has been in the front end. I think that is warranted. Um, but I think a lot of the panic, a lot of the speculation now that rates are you know, off to the moon 
I think that will prove to be misplaced this year. And we can... uh, thanks, Jim. And maybe as a follow-up and to get the perspective from, from an uh, equity investor uh, based in the U.S., George, to you, all right, the, the Fed uh, put seems to be gone, at least for now. You know, what are your thoughts on volatility and equity markets in the U.S. based on that? Yeah, thanks, Enrique. I think there's no question that the Fed put, if it exists at all, exists at a much lower level than it has in the past. Um, there is no question that central banks around the world now are going to be aggressively recalibrating monetary policy, right? You've seen the uh, Jay Powell back in November of 21 talk about having to reset uh, where Fed expectations were, right? Uh, inflation expectations were, were persistent and running higher than they thought. And you saw that the Bank of England and Bank of Canada in particular were were certainly on the edge of being much more aggressive and hawkish in policy. We've seen, you know, the, the ramifications of over a decade of quantitative easing, as well as aggressive central bank policy jumping on the curve, both the front and the long end at every particular moment, that's ending, right? Um, we're clearly seeing the, the question now is, to what degree is quantitative easing going to end? I use it just a roll off. Are we going to be selling off assets aggressively? Do we need to hike rates? And that volatility is, I mean, that's clearly creating volatility in fixed income markets, which is clearly spilling over to equity markets. One of the biggest areas that we're going to see is for the last decade plus, given that Fed put, there was always a buy the dip mentality that worked. That's unlikely to be the same, uh, to be the same going forward. Moreover, when you have discount rates that are this low, in fact, with real rates for the last year plus in serious negative territory throughout much of the developed world, um, asset prices get really skewed and you create very systematic valuation dislocations, right? Um, long dated assets, i.e. Uh, become, you know, a dollar 10 years from now is more valuable than a dollar today. That is a flip of financial theory. And that means that a lot of secular growing stocks, i.e. even not only pre-earning, but even pre-revenue companies were valued at astronomical valuations. That's done. Um, there's going to be a, you know, I heard of sort of Damocles hanging over the market in terms of valuation. I think that's fair. And I think that is going to create significant rotation and volatility in equity markets. I don't think uh, we're about to end. I think we're ex you should expect this over the next year plus as this all settles. Thanks, George. Uh Jim, maybe back to you to follow up and expand on, on fixed income markets. Look, we, we all accept that inflation is here, whether it's going to be here for the next two years or five years or one year is to be is to be seen. But assume that it's here and it's meaningful. And even though it's already priced in, are there likely going to be winners and losers from a, from a uh, sector perspective in fixed income that you're thinking about? Well, I think... First of all, it's a bit of a myth that higher inflation is bad for all risk assets. In fact, the opposite is true. And certainly when you have as much debt as we do globally, I think deflation is a risk that you need to stay comfortably away from that. Now, comfortable is not 7%, by the way. So I think higher inflation by itself is something that, that if it rolls over, I wouldn't fear too much. Um, it has to roll over though. Markets are not pricing in this, a, a continuation of this kind of fire that we're seeing in the inflationary front. I think if that persists, it's negative for risk assets um, across the board. Um, but I would point to fixed income generally and high quality bonds as probably the area most likely to get hurt by inflation. And, and I think you've already seen that. And we gave the super low levels of rates that we saw globally didn't help as a starting point. But that's where I think repricing inflation is still probably you know, at, at most risk. Um, I, I think credit should hold in well. We expect defaults to be close to record lows, almost non-existent this year. And so you know, I would think the, the fear of inflation, by the way, is not so much rising prices. It's that it gets so high that it forces a response from policymakers, changes the narrative. And I think we're on the cusp. If we don't see inflation peak here in the next two months, as it should, by the way, so the numbers are gonna be shocking, um, look for those to be the high. That's what the market is expecting. That's what is priced in. And if you get that, it should support risk assets. 
but I, but I think as George said, you've had years where you may have pulled returns a bit forward. So you know, don't, don't expect heroic returns, I think, in risk assets. But you know, high quality bonds still look a, a little bit in jeopardy. Um, credit, um, emerging markets have been hit hard. They can probably come back, I, I think, more quickly as they're already in many cases easy. So you're, okay. you're starting to see that divergence and with volatility and divergence, I still think there's plenty of opportunities out there you know, over the, the next two years. Thanks, Jim. Maybe over to David now. David, you, you know, you obviously uh, are in, in a part of the market that has a fair amount of, of, of derivatives and, and, and risk pricing, right, in alternatives land. Um, what are you seeing in, in, in how levered investors and, and investors that invest in, 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 in deriv derivatives, such as the ones that you trade in, are saying about inflation going forward? And, 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 and real rates for that matter. That's uh, something that you monitor. So I, I think that um, uh, the, the impact of, of higher rates uh, and, and seeing inflation as a catalyst for that has a, a, a different impact depending on which part of the alternatives world you're mm -hmm. considering. Uh, and it's definitely not a homogeneous world in, in a way in which you can, in very broad brush terms, think of equities as homogeneous or fixed income as homogeneous. And I think in that paradigm, higher interest rates mean exactly as George outlined, lower present values. And it's a, it's a much harder bogey for those traditional assets where you're effectively discounting a series of cash flows to deal with a high inflation, high interest rate environment. If you move to the alternatives world, some parts of it mirror their counterparts on the fixed income and, and equity world. So private equity, is a lot like public equity, but with a whole lot more borrowing. So you have a much bigger sensitivity to discount rates and you also have a much bigger sensitivity to short-term interest rates to fund it. So I think areas like that are particularly exposed to a higher interest rate environment and, and the savior may be higher cash flows through higher inflation. And I think, again, very broad brush terms, private debt is, is more similar to, to non-private debt, to public debt, that it is different and the same sort of considerations go. So where are alternatives different? And I would say alternatives are different in the sense that you can access assets that are real, uh, that are real assets directly. Uh, and a good example of that is commodities. So we're seeing quite a lot of rotation, particularly from uh, institutional clients in, into commodities as a means of providing direct protection from, from, um, from inflation, from higher interest rates. And there are very good he historical precedents for this working. Uh, commodities are, are effectively uh, inflation indexed assets. Another area uh, of the alternative space that does very well in a higher inflation environment, and it's kind of logical if you think about the basis for the strategy is trend following. So trend following is, is what seems like a very simple strategy that prices, when they move in one direction, continue to move in that direction, they exhibit momentum. The devil is in the details in terms of setting up a portfolio to trade that effectively and, and with the right sort of cost structure. But if you think about inflation as being prices moving in one direction uh, upwards, then it's not surprising that a trend following strategy can capture uh, inflation in prices, whether it's downwards moves in traditional fixed income, uh, government bonds, uh, or whether it's upward moves in uh, commodities, equities, and so on. So there are parts of the alternatives universe that actually do very well in inflationary environments. So I think it's, it's, it's difficult to think about alts in, as, a, as a single homogeneous sphere. Uh, and it's very important to select what you want uh, your alternatives to do and how they're structured. That's the key. Thanks, David. Uh, maybe back to equities um, for both uh, George and Alex. Maybe Alex, you take the, the first question first. Um, any, any sense of, of where we might be headed in the debate of growth versus value? We've had a huge rotation away from growth over the last you know, six to seven months, uh, a violent rotation. What are you seeing today, whether it's in, in Europe or even for that matter in, in the US? So I think, um, you know, 2021, we saw, you know, a number of actually two or three shifts 
um, between sort of growth dynamics and, and value dynamics in terms of uh, the stock market and, and drivers therein. Um, so looking forward, I think that always to me tells me about regime change. I mean, when you're getting um, you know, changing dynamics, changing drivers, as we've been talking about inflation, interest rates rising, you know, that's the changing drivers, I think. And, and you get these periods of, of some, some styles doing better than others. But I think the consistency comes in, you know, a year or two's time. And we've certainly seen the beginning of 2021, uh, two rather, you know, a big shift, downshift in, in a lot of technology names, a lot of high growth names, um, based a lot around less the earnings, more around the valuations, you know, what, what's the price we should be paying for many of these assets. Um, and I'm expecting more of that to come through, actually. We, we're just entering earnings season. We should see some com confirmation of, of good growth actually coming in Q4 uh, of last year. And actually, you know, GDP forecasts, earning forecasts are all pointing to above trend numbers for this year as well. It does depend how quickly we open up economies, uh, how much tourism gets going, some of the big drivers in there. Um, also, China has been, you know, relatively slow growth out of the Chinese economy. Is, is that going to pick up? Uh, towards the second half of this year, that would be a big helpful pickup, I think, for a lot of uh, manufacturing, engineering, and, and raw materials. So there's a lot of drivers to, to growth that, that should be positive, I think. Um, will that favour value investing or, or growth? It's, it's, again, a bit difficult. I think the macro favours more value, um, you know, in terms of, of pricing assets, you know, pretty low, you know, the, the average, you know, uh, value stocks on sort of 12 to 13 times earnings, growth stocks run over 20 times. So there's a big difference there. But then there's great growth stocks. And some companies are still um, performing exceptionally well, but will produce very strong earnings numbers and, and confirmation um, therein of their valuation. So I'm expecting still 2022, a lot of changing in that dynamic, probably at the margin, a, a better market for value investors there. Yeah, thanks, Alex. And maybe George, staying with the theme of uh, style and, and equity return. Any thoughts on small versus large globally? Yeah, no, thanks, Enrique. I think, look, I think the the large, you know, especially the concentration of capital into some of these giga caps, the Microsofts, Apples, Metas, Nvidia's, um, you know, alphabets of the world, has created a real dislocation in markets, right where. You know, those five stocks alone account for well over 40% uh, of the Russell 1000 growth, nearly 50% of the NASDAQ 100, um, and, you know, nearly a quarter of the S&P, right? I mean, so you've got five stocks accounting for massive amount of capital. Um, in fact, even when Meta declined the other day and lost $230 billion U.S. In, in value, that decline, that $230 billion, was greater than all but uh, 23 stocks in the S&P 500. So I think we could be seeing a situation where you have such concentration of capital in just a few names that smaller cap, by definition, could do a lot better if those larger caps start to stumble. And given the valuations in some of those larger caps and the concentration um, you know, of capital there, I think it's, it's a worry. For example, we saw Tesla go right before the pandemic from 70 billion to 700 billion by year end and then you know, get over a trillion. Um, is it reasonable to be worried about a reversion in that kind of performance? I think so. And so I think there's going to be some evidence that you're going to have as part of this value, potential value rotation that Alex talked about, a more interesting, more productive market for smaller cap names. Thanks, George. And maybe just one more question uh, for the group, uh, or for David for that matter, before we turn over to uh, the questions from, from the audience. Um, We've had uh, uh, somewhat of a shock in markets in January where both stocks and bonds have both gone down significantly. Uh, you know, you always hope that there's a correlation effect between stocks and bonds and one goes up, the other one goes down and vice versa. So you get smoother returns. Uh, that has not happened in, in January. And that's typical of a market that is in, you know, in fear. Um, what are your thoughts on that, on that level of correlation between those two asset classes? and uh, what about some of the alternative asset classes uh, and are they providing uh, some level of diversification during this uh, tough period? Yeah, I, I think the correlation between bond and equities is, is maybe along with the, the sort of global risk-free rate, uh, uh, one of the critical parameters that, that drives our industry uh, because it dictates the risk of a balanced portfolio. And for most of the last 25 years, so going back to about 1998, 
that correlation has been negative. So equities up, bonds down, and it means a balanced portfolio has less risk than uh, than its constituents. But if that that uh, correlation stays positive, bonds up, equities up, and vice versa, uh, then that makes balanced portfolios far uh, more risky, and it, it makes it harder for for investors to hold uh, an asset allocation at a given risk profile. So th this is dangerous structurally for markets, both for highly levered investors and for normal investors. So it's something that we keep a close eye on. And it, it's certainly something that tends to be consistent with inflationary times. Uh, alternatives, I, I'd repeat what I said earlier, alternatives are not a, um, a, a uniform set of assets. Uh, and I think even if you can't see it because some of the assets don't mark, and I, again, I come back to private equity, it's something that is that has as a feature its inability to be marked. But if equities are going down and, and uh, bonds are going down, then it's definitely not good for, for assets like private equities. That, that said, uh, trend following has done well this year. Uh, and if you've had the right positioning in an alpha sense, the right, the right bets, if you like, in the portfolio, it's been possible to set up a defensive um, alternative strategy and even to, to, to add value uh, on a year-to-date basis. So it's an environment that creates challenges, but I, I think that uh, alternatives investors are capable of meeting those challenges, even in, in uh, an environment with a headwind for traditional asset classes. Uh, thanks, David. I think before I turn it over to Lucy, it, it feels to me that this, this year, it always feels this way, but sometimes it's actually true, that it's going to be a much more volatile year in, in markets, whether it be stocks and bonds. And I think our clients uh, hopefully feel comfortable that we, we at Janice Henderson uh, value return as much as the valuation of risk and understanding risk. So the balance of the two will be something that we'll continue to look at as we invest actively for our clients. So with that said, let me turn it over to Lucy and maybe there's a couple of questions, maybe one or two questions that we have time for from the audience. Yeah, great to hear from you all. Uh, Enrique, thanks so much. I am looking forward to getting some fantastic questions from you. Don't forget it, it's really simple. We've got that ask a question chat box there for you. So you just type in your question uh, we've got a team looking at them, I'm looking at them as well, and we'll try and get those questions answered. Uh, thanks guys for that, there were some really good thoughts there, and I know that some of these ideas you've brought up so far are going to be expanded on over the next few days, but we've had a couple of questions in, and um, Alex, the first one is for you. What do you feel are the biggest risks to the market this year? Would you say it's geopolitical instability or some of the market technicals that you've been talking about? I, th I think there's plenty of geopolitical risk, you know, in the newspapers and on the news. But but the reality of whether they hit economic output and, and people's decisions to do things is 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 really, you know, often it's more more that news and worrying. Markets are a lot calmer than that. So I think the big one is inflation in terms of prices going up. So what does that mean for people's spending patterns? You know, and it's the same for companies. You know, they're seeing big price rises for a lot of raw materials and supply chain issues. So I think it's those two, I think, that are going to be the big drivers to whether corporate earnings in each different corporate go up or, or, or a static or even fall. And, and I think companies are still struggling. Uh, we hear that, you know, some of the transport issues are easing. And, and certainly Maersk, a uh, big shipping company today, said, you know, second half is going to be a lot easier, uh, a lot more supply coming through. But, you know, still there are big bottlenecks in, in chip manufacturing and other elements. And it, it only takes in, say, a car, a couple of elements to be missing. and You can't produce the, the entire car. So I think it's, it's price rises, how that affects people's um, spending patterns uh, and, then, and then the supply, I think. Thanks, Alex. Here's one for you, Jim, and it's around... Um zombie companies, this growing concern, uh, concerns around these companies becoming insolvent and defaulting. What are your concerns or what are you seeing around that? Um, I think default risk is still quite low and real rates have risen. I think what we need to keep in mind, they're still extraordinarily low, right? And real rates are a good predictor of default, say two or three years out. And if the economy is growing in nominal terms and you're able to borrow at a rate that is equal or less than that nominal growth rate, it's actually hard for a company to disappear. So um, I think defaults stay low. Now the idea that zombie companies spread across the globe as they did say in Japan a decade ago is probably quite low. There's enough other competitive pressures 
that I think will lead to those companies either disappearing or being purchased or something. Um, but I don't think the, the appearance of a, a few more zombie-like companies will lead to higher defaults here. Um, I, I think if you've overly relied on a single commodity price or something like that, a single stream of revenues, that's a sign of risk. If you're overly exposed to short-term borrowing, you know, something that David brought up, that's a risk. But I still look at at least for the next 18 months default staying very well under control. Great, Jim, thank you. We're gonna leave it there. Really good to get your thoughts though. And I'm also looking forward to hearing sort of some of these themes that you've mentioned just being expanded on over the next few days. So thanks so much for that great session, Enrique. Thank you, Lucy, thank you.